So you see a lot of farmers that are really good at farming, but they're sucky at, at business. And you see some business guys that think they want to be a farmers and it turns out they don't like to get their hands dirty. So to find that perfect you know, combination of, of team is really important to us. Hey, Rent to Retires, it's Adam Schrader here with another episode joined as usual by the CEO and founder of Rent to Retirement, Zach Lee Master. We are joined today by Chris Raleigh. He is the founder and CEO of the company Harvest Returns. And we're going to be diving into something that, uh, as far as I can recall, we have never touched on, and that is uh, investing in agriculture. So, Chris, thanks for joining us. Really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So run us through a little bit of your background of how you got into real estate in general, but then also kind of how you caught the uh, the bug of not owning properties, but owning land with things growing on it. Yeah, um, it's kind of a long, windy story, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, I was in a, a naval officer, uh, served time out in the destroyer and then worked in the Pentagon and then got out and did some stuff in the reserves for a long, long period of time. But uh, my first job out of the Navy was with Jones Lang LaSalle. I was, uh, now it's JLL, people are familiar with that. Worked as a property manager, decided I was tired of making other people money working in real estate. So went out there and found a single family home, uh, got into it. It was down in uh, College Station, Texas, which is where I went to school. So I was pretty familiar with the, the market down there. Um, it's a great market, by the way, had, had students in there eventually moved out of the student housing side, which is which is always fun, and then uh, decided to get into duplexes, same market, but uh, got into duplexes, and eventually I decided I wanted to be a developer. So went out and bought some land, um, plotted it all up, didn't know what I was doing, was able to get out of that before I lost any money and actually made just a little bit of money. But I, I really started looking at the land side of things, and in my Navy travels, you know, I went to a lot of places where people are – you know, they don't have supermarkets and they don't have restaurants and they don't have like, you know, 24 seven access to food like we do. And they have to grow their own food or, or buy it from, uh, you know, the local market. So it really made me think about agriculture and food. And back in 2015, as I was looking to sort of diversify my real estate portfolio into, into some kind of farming, you know, at that point I learned it was hard to do uh, without either knowing somebody that, that was in farming or being a farmer background yourself, um, or having a lot of capital to get into a piece of land that was made sense from a scaling perspective to make money. It's, it's not necessarily like single family where you can kind of get into real estate really small and then sort of grow yourself. You, you've got to, you got to start with some sort of scale and know how. So I didn't have that. So I kind of skipped a bunch of steps and decided to just, start a platform for people to invest in farms um, and taught, taught myself that way. And uh, back in 2016, we did that. We started up the company Harvest Returns. Since then, we've raised um, over $31 million for, I think, something like 50 different farms and ranches and agriculture businesses. And essentially what we are is we, we have a, a flow of offerings that come in, flow of deals. We do the due diligence and we allow people to invest in these farms and ranches at a small, you know, easy to access amount, anywhere from 5,000 to say $25,000 is sort of our minimum investment size. And uh, we've done, you know, brought a lot of momentum, started, helped a lot of farmers either start their farm or expand their farm. And it's, it's pretty, been pretty re rewarding. You mentioned the people, you know, y'all do the due diligence, you know, it's, fairly simple to do due diligence on, you know, single family rentals. Um, but as you got into this, how, how does one go about actually doing due diligence on, you know, farmland or, you know, if you're growing trees and all of that, cause it's, it seems a lot more complicated running comps seems miserable or impossible. I mean, how do you do that? Yeah. You know, you're, you're right on the single family, as long as you kind of follow the parameters and understand you know, you're, you're making positive cash flow. You, you can, you can do okay. in in single family and other types of real estate. So you, you kind of seen one house, you've seen them all, right. Whether it's, you know, you're doing fix and flips or, you know, whatever with, with farms, it's like, you've seen one farm, you've seen one farm. So it is uh, a little bit tougher on a diligent side on the land side. There are definitely comparables and there's more and more platforms that enable you to kind of get an apples to apples view of just the land piece. 
but the farming piece itself, um, we've developed some expertise in, in a few different what we call verticals, you know, segments of agriculture, uh, and I can go into those. But it, it's the first thing we're looking at is, is numbers. Do the numbers make sense? We're looking at the the team that the involved that the farmer brings us. Does do they one you know know how to grow whatever they're supposed to be growing, um, and two do they have business savvy? So you see a lot of Farmers are really good at farming, but they're sucky at, at business. And you see some business guys that think they want to be a farmers, and it turns out they don't like to get their hands dirty. So to find that perfect, you know, combination of of team is really important to us. Once it kind of makes it through that initial screening, we dig into the pro formas, we look at the numbers, look at the cash flow projections, and then we decide um, what is the deal going to look like. Is it sometimes they come to us and they have very strong parameters of what they want. You know, they want equity or they want debt. So we've done equity, we've done debt, um, where we we'll give a farmer a loan or a rancher a loan. And then basically we syndicate that loan and, and then we, you know, pay the cash flow from that loan and the principal, or we've done equity where we actually own a farm or own a piece of the farming operation. We might take cash flows from it and then eventually it's either going to get sold or refinanced and we're taken out our equity from that perspective. Chris, I want to back up a little bit and um, understand like just what, like what are the key differences and why, why invest in agriculture in in general and in land? I mean, I think that when we, when we look at, uh, I mean, you're really investing in a business, right? And in all things considered, Mm -hmm. this is looking at like income. I mean, same thing when you evaluate a a residential house, like you look at it as a business, but it's, yeah, it's, it's much easier metrics to, to look at on the surface. Um, and we know that land is always a good thing to, to buy. Um, and, you know, there's not being any more land made out there. So yeah. um, land is, is good to, to own. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes the problem with land is that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't produce income. And so I know when yeah. people are like syndicating and raising capital for the multifamily investments, like the play or the, the goal is to take an underperforming asset Mm-hmm. and then increase the performance of it and then exit it at some point. And so people yep. are obtaining a return on on their investment, like as that property is being, um, you know, the, the improvements are being, the rents are being raised and the income is being, and then mm-hmm. they get like an IRR at the end when they mm-hmm. you know, exit the property. But is that the same thing you're doing? Are you improving the business and coming in a, like as a consultant or talk to me more about like what you're doing with the properties that you're either lending to getting an equity piece in yeah. or raising money for. So, yeah, in some cases very similar to, you know, investing in, in a real estate deal, you know, people are always looking for what the saying, the highest and best use of land and farming is no different. So, you know, you have an empty field, what crop is being planted. And instead of having tenants paying rent, like you do in a you know single multifamily home, your your tenants are your crops, right? And you're growing your crops and you're selling your crops. And and there's a lot of variables there, as you said. You know what is the what's the market price of the crop? So you're dealing with, you know, just like rents, they go up and they go down, primarily up. But it, you know, it's all depending on what's the neighborhood, what are the comps. Same thing with crops. It's you know what are those crops going for? So let's just say you're growing berries, strawberries blueberries, whatever, um, you know, what's the current market price that can be very seasonally because the availability of these crops is done seasonally. And, you know, they may be flown up from Mexico or brought up from Mexico and or grown in California, whatever, depending on the season. And as far as the, the value add, in some cases, we're, we're loaning to an existing operation that wants to expand. So they want to buy some more land or they want to buy some more cows they grow their revenues. Uh, there's a lot of economies of scale to be had in farming. So the bigger you are, especially if you're, you know, kind of a smaller, newer farmer, you're competing against these giant industrial types of farms. So the more, more land you have, the more capital you have, the better you can compete. Um, and, and we're, we're in several little niches. So one of those niches is, is grass fed livestock or regenerative livestock. So, um, it's a higher premium. You go into a grocery store and if you look at like grass fed, grass finished livestock at like a whole food or beef, you're going to, you're going to pay higher dollar. And that means the rancher is going to get a higher dollar. There's a lot of intricacies. There's also, there's a sustainability factor. Um, we've done some controlled environment agriculture, which is indoor agriculture. So like hydroponics. So if you've ever been, um, you know, you may have heard like of urban farms, 
Um, I'm sure there's some in Austin. I know there's some in Denver. We've got some in Dallas. We funded one in Dallas. We funded one in Alabama. We funded one in uh, Omaha. People are growing food closer to where it's produced. Most of the lettuce, leafy greens we eat in the United States are grown in a single county in California and shipped all over the country, Monterey, California, Salinas Valley, California, and it's shipped all over the country. So why not grow those indoors where it makes more sense? So, so indoors- but, but still, are you, are you, so is it play here is like, you're, you're not taking an underperforming farm and making it a better performing farm and then selling it off, right? You are basically lending capital, you're raising capital, you, you lend it to the farms to expand, to possibly to expand yeah. or develop, okay. even development. So if you think of like, you know, a greenfield development, somebody's got a piece of land or in the case of these urban farms, they, they take an office, an old warehouse building and they turn it to an urban farm. So you're mm-hmm. repurposing the, the building for something different. Well, let's go back to my initial question then yeah. on um, and, and just get less away from like the, okay, the syndication aspect and, and stuff you're actually working on to focus mm-hmm. on just like why, Agri- why agricultural in general, you know, like what are some differences yeah. um, in investing in agricultural from a financing, from a tax perspective? Why would someone consider if they're going to go out and not lend money to someone, they're just going to mm-hmm. be interested in buying their own, you know, yeah. and, and getting into that asset class, like, what are some key differences that they need to be aware of and why would they do that over residential? Sure. So, you know, the first thing is what we, we kind of call the, the drivers in the, the industry. You named one of them. They're not making any more land. So land is becoming scarcer. Arable agricultural land suitable for growing things is becoming scarcer as, you know, cities grow. They develop over fields. We've all seen that. Uh, anybody that's, that's been around a while, especially if you live in a rapid growing city, that there's they sprawl outwards and they go over fields that were formerly used for agriculture. Um, the second piece is just demographics. Population of the of the world right now, we're about 8 billion. We're projected to be about 10 billion by 2050. It continues to grow. There's more mouths to feed, less land to do it. Farmers need to become more efficient, environmentally sustainable in how they're producing food. So that's kind of our investing thesis is that we're looking for farmers that are, you know, doing growing food in different, more efficient ways. Um, as far as things like taxes, um, you know, there are tax benefits uh, as everybody probably knows, there's a lot of subsidies that go in the U S to farmers. Some farmers get paid not to grow on their land. It's very interesting. That's, you know, that's definitely a, a core part of some, um, farming like row crop farmers, soy wheat, you know, if there's, there's a lot of insurance, um, you know, crops can be insured. So it's just like a, like a building or a house. Uh, you've got some risk management involved in there. And then there are some tax favorability. You know, there's depreciation depending on what, what you're doing to it. Obviously, you don't depreciate land, but you can depreciate things like trees. If you're growing trees, you can depreciate um, infrastructure on a farm. So there's those sorts, same sorts of tax benefits you might get in owning real estate. And, and there's also, you know, some credits and sustainability and carbon credits and things like that, that some of our farmers. I mean, can, we, can we be really um, specific on some of those? I mean, let's let's like let's talk about a, a, how someone I really what I want to get out of this, I think, is applying how um, our audience can. Let's say they they're interested in owning, you know, yeah. some, some farmland or something like. Yeah. How, how can they apply that? How can the average investor go out and, and find land or livestock. Mm-hmm. I come from a, a farming and ranching background in my family. Um, yeah. I'm, from, I'm from Wyoming. They're, they're all farmers and ranchers, uh, except for my parents who are electricians, but their grandparents, their brothers and sisters are. Yeah. We were out branding cows not too long ago uh, at my uncle's ranch, but like, you know, I, and I still haven't gotten into the details specifically with them, but they were all, I, I know that in my discussions, like with my uncle, he always talks about the, hundred percent depreciable assets of livestock and like just go and buy some livestock and then put it on my land, you know, in in like the tax benefits. But let's talk about how we could, the average person can like start investing in, in land without like lending money. You know what I mean? Like what are, can we, what are, yeah, I mean, it's, that's hard because I, I guarantee if you talk to your family, most of them, that land has probably been in their family for more than one generation. Um, that's a very common situation in farming. Most of the farmers, most of the farmland is owned by absentee farmer landlords. I mean, more and more of it's kind of being bought up by corporations and investment banks and, and syndications like ours, but most of it's still owned by, you know, 
the grandfather who used to be a farmer and now he's not. And maybe there's a grandchild involved in farming or maybe it's skipped a generation or whatever. So for an individual investor, it's, it's, I'll, I will freely admit it's very um, tough and that's what we discovered and that's why we built our platform. But there are ways if you just want exposure to the a- asset class that are really low, um, you know, entry point, there's farmland REITs, farmland funds publicly traded. You can go out there and buy, you know, 50 shares of, of this or that. Um, th- those have done pretty well lately. Uh, there are some, you know, caveats because they're publicly traded. They're, they can- tend to go with the stock market. If you want to buy a piece of land, farmland, you identify it and you you can certainly do that. Find a farmland broker, go out and find a piece. And then if you don't have the farming experience, you can hire somebody to either run their cattle on it. You know, they'll pay you rent or you can have a farmer pay you rent for owning that land. That's definitely. You lease it out, right? So that's, that's yeah, an example. Yeah, you lease it out to mm-hmm. farmers. Most, most farmers, like I said, are, you know, most farmland is owned by absentee owners and, and, you know, farmed by somebody else or somebody else runs the cattle. Can we, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Because, um, so I, I was an air force captain for, for seven years and I was stationed in North Dakota. I started yeah. to do, um, I, I did a lot of wholesaling and flipping in that area. And just because of the kind of rural aspect of it, um, we wholesaled farms and sometimes yeah. we, we acquired, um, actually some farms that we ended up leasing uh-huh. out, but it was very really interesting to me. Like, Actually, that's really accessible of, um, and we never held one for very long. It, we yeah. always turn it over to other aggregators or, or mm-hmm. farmers taking on um, more land and, and looking for projects. But um, it was interesting that like you can pick up a farm, like it doesn't have to be this large, huge like yeah. operation. Like you can pick up a crop, right? Or a, you know, an acre, five acre, 10 acre farm, whatever, uh-huh. um, where there's just small crops, but um, and then lease it out. Someone will just lease it out. So in that area, you, you own land, it's producing yeah. income. What are, what are the tax benefits and the business structure look like just on like owning a, a farm? Um, you, can we talk about that just real? Yeah, like, I mean, if you're, if you're definitely like like you were, if you're in a rural area and there's a lot of farms around you and you kind of know the market and have contacts, I think that's a great thing. You know, most of our investors are urban, suburban. They don't live places where they're farm. But tax benefits, you know, very low tax rates. Um, most places have some sort of agriculture exemption, most districts. So, um, what does that look like? What does the agriculture exemption look like? Can we insane? Uh, yeah. I mean, do you have numbers to share? I, I, mean, I don't know specific. I mean, it's, it's, I, I can tell you, yeah, uh, go ahead. my, my in-laws own over 200 acres in, uh, like kind of Southeast Texas. They pay under three thousand dollars a year in property yeah. taxes because of ag exemption so you could is, have you know a million plus people prop piece million dollar plus piece of property and pay hundreds of dollars worth of taxes where if that was a single home or multifamily, you'd be paying seven eight percent here in texas um so yeah it's that's very favorable uh you mentioned depreciation that's very similar to the real estate side if you've got something you know a depreciable asset on your land you just you can't do much with the land itself there's things called conservation easements so somebody might have you know let's say 100 acres but 10 of the acres are not farmable and you can put it in a conservation easement and take um pretty significant tax tax benefits from doing that um you know what what is, what is a conservation easement and, and can you clarify the tax benefits a little bit more um, yeah it's it's a you know we don't work with these but there's a lot of people that do there you know it's like a land trust and you're basically telling the government that you're never going to develop this piece of land you're going to keep it like a wetland or something just for wildlife um adjacent to your agriculture and i it's almost like a hundred percent write off i can't don't quote me on that but it's it's a pretty significant type of um tax benefits it's closer to like what you might get in oil and gas drilling where can you still can right you still farm it on it He's no you can't it. you can't farm that piece of land but it can be adjacent it can be it's usually going to be like hilly or wet too wet to farm anyway can you lease it, it out for hunting do you know uh, can you, you have think, income you on it do that for hunting and that's another source of revenue a lot of farmers do you know if you have timber or farmland you know in the off season in the winter when you're not growing anything you rent, you know, do leases to hunters, you, you get a, another source of revenue. Uh, you know, I've hunted on land before where there's cows running around. You got to make sure you don't shoot the cow. So it's, uh, that's pretty common here in Texas. Yeah, that's, a, that's a fat looking deer, right? Yeah. So, why did you pick the U S I mean, there's a lot of, you know, I've seen a lot of farm farmland and agriculture mm-hmm. and, you know, 
lumber investing outside of the U.S. that you know <laughs> seems a bit cheaper. Um, yeah, it would be in the U.S. Uh, why did y'all? Ch- and seems like you could buy it individually. So why did y'all pick the U.S.? Um, mostly for simpl- simplification's sake. You know, when you start to go overseas, you got a lot of crazy tax things, cross border taxes. You've got some currency risk. Um, you know, there's countries where you don't, like Panama, where you you greatly mitigate a lot of that stuff. And you know, land ownership is so different. We knew we were gonna our our business model is based on doing a lot of deals and keeping them in the U S keeps things fairly simplified. That said, we've done a few foreign deals. We've actually done deals as far as Ghana, West Africa. Um, a couple of those deals didn't go well. One of them's going very well where they're growing bananas right now. So, um, we are familiar with some foreign jurisdictions, but they're, they're harder to underwrite. They're harder to visit. They're harder to know what's really going on. Whereas I can drive, you know, two hours and visit one of my farms here in Texas and, you know, lay my eyes on it and see what's really going on. What are some of the risks uh, investing in agriculture? I mean, let's, I want to talk about that as well as the financing yeah. of like someone, like how does debt work mm-hmm. on, on land? I mean, but what is, um, like, what are some of the risks? Uh, obviously, if you're in crops, like that could be, you know, extremely economically driven, like on a global yeah. scale, mm-hmm. uh, you have seasonality, as you mentioned, and, and weather. Um, yep. you, you have, I mean, there's just a lot of variability. So what are the risks and how does, how does one mitigate that? Yeah. I mean, you, you nailed the first one. It's, it's kind of those environmental aspects of, you know, weather too much rain. So for several years, California got too little rain. And then this spring it got too much rain and they were both pretty damaging to its crops out there. Um, same thing with cattle farmers. You don't have enough rain. You can't grow grass. You can't, you can't feed your cattle or you have to pay extra to bring in, you know, supplemental feeds to feed your cattle, which raises the prices, which is one of the reasons we're seeing really high beef prices right now, um, among others. But uh, so there's that weather risk, there's disease risk, you know, there used to be a really strong citrus industry in Florida, a lot of that has been um, destroyed over the past decade or so from this disease called citrus rust. Um, So disease is one Um, market risk, as far as you know, the commodities are up, but then they can go down. So if you're dealing, if you're investing in a piece in a farm that might have a commodity-based product, that's uh, there's some risks there where you know you might be growing a lot, but you can't sell it for what the input costs were. It's just like being negative cash flow on a upside down on a, uh, a property. Um, and then you know, but there's ways to mitigate those risks. So one of it is just good management practices, having an experienced farmer that knows what they're doing actually on the land and then um there's crop insurance and things like that and there's what we tend to be in spaces where they're more niche so you're not exposed to a lot of commodity risk so we don't for instance do like soybean corn farms there's other places you can invest in those just because for a lot of reasons one there's there's plenty of places for those folks to get financing but also um that it's it's riskier from a cash flow perspective but there's also a big backstop. USDA guarantees these loans and things like that. So, you know, happy to talk about the financial structures as well. Yeah. So whenever, let's talk about that a little bit. So, you know, I've got, you know, let's just say I've got $100,000. I want to, you know, loan it out to somebody. Um, uh-huh. I find a farmer looking to do it. What are, what's a realistic terms that you can, um, that you would give somebody like that? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, Think about like a real estate purchase, you have a capital stack. So whether it's a single family home or a big commercial office building or anything in between, you might have some equity, you know, down payment, you might have some debt. You might, if you get really complicated, you might have like bridge loans and mezzanine debt and things like that. But you've got, um, you know, first of all, we're gonna look at the project. What are the capital sources? Sometimes a farmer will come to us and they've got a piece of land they're sitting on. It's really valuable, but they don't have any cattle they don't have any fencing, they don't have any pens, all the things you need to do to raise raise livestock. So we will provide them a loan to help them acquire the cattle, help them acquire the fencing. And you know, right now, just from a pure debt perspective, we're seeing you know, 12 to 17% uh, returns to our investors. Uh, that's that's kind of our, our most recent track record. I think the past three years was like 12% on, on the debt side. 
uh, if you're investing and then somebody else is bringing like maybe a loan, like maybe they're going to their farm credit union to get a loan to buy a piece of land and we're investing in the company equities, they take that hundred thousand dollars as part of a bigger, you know, multi-million dollar farm acquisition or farm improvement. Um, you might see higher returns. It just depends. Uh, you might see above 20% IRR if uh, internal rate of return, you know, if all the pieces are in place and, and, uh, things put together correctly. Chris, um, when you, when you're structuring, cause basically it sounds like your uh, lending capital, your, your platform is to lend capital to farmers that you want to, you know, create this new business opportunity, mm -hmm. expand, what, what have you. Um, and, and they're, you know, coming to you for financing. Um, are you securitizing this against the land? Because some of this is for like future potential revenue, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's not, yeah. We need to so, so we will, you know, we're always going to look for what the collateral is, just like anybody, any body lending money, you know, what, how, how secure is my money? So we will secure it against land, like the example I provided where maybe they got a nice piece of land, but they don't have anything else. We'll secure the cattle. We've got a pretty good system now where we can, you know, look at their cattle inventories using software. So we're, we're confident that they've got enough cattle to um, you know, we're, we've never had to do it. Knock on wood. We, we've never had to repossess cattle, but if we had to, we could, and then just auction that off. We, we wouldn't want to run that place. Um, or we could sell the land, you know, it's like any kind of workout where if you had to, a loan default, you're going to look for a, some sort of recourse to be able to get the investor's principal back. And are you in first position for that? Or you're, they're not taking out debt. We, we've done first and second. Okay. Yeah, we've done first and second. Okay. So if I'm looking to get it into this, what is the first step that somebody would have to take to start investing in agriculture? Is it just finding, go on some website and find farmers looking for financing or what's the first thing you have to do? Yeah. I mean, that's our model. We've got the cash flow or, or we've got the deal flow where farmers know that we provide capital. They come to us and then, you know, if people want to invest, they can come to our platform. That's all pretty soup to nuts pretty automated process. But if you want to, you know, there's other ways. If you want to go out, I'd find a farm, uh, a land broker, you know, try to do it as close to where you are as possible, just so you can get out there and look at the land. There's advisors, depending on how big you, you know, how much you're investing, you can, you can go out there and get the comps. You can hire a farm management company to manage it for you. Just like you might hire a property management company. You can, um, you know, hire, soil analysis and do all those sorts of things in the due diligence process or you can come to harvest returns and we've kind of we've kind of taken care of all that i was looking at a uh, land deal it was one or two years ago um where we, we were looking at um it wasn't farming but maybe putting on some where there was going to be future potential income from um you know like a, a small campsite type of thing um mm -hmm. it, didn't, it didn't end up working out just based on there's a lot more cleanup uh, on and money involved in the development of it than we anticipated. But one thing that was interesting to me is like, um, and I've also looked at some some farm stuff in the past, but like financing, like if there's not current income on it, like mm -hmm. I couldn't find anyone to finance it. Um, like basically there, especially on the land that was just, uh, what needed to be developed, there's just like no loan options for me, at least out, yeah. out here that I was able to find. Um, so it was challenging. It's like I needed private money. I needed, mm -hmm. I needed cash um, to do it. And then I was trying to really wrap my head around the, the tax side of things was like, well, how can I structure this to me the most tax efficient structure? Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, land is not depreciable. Um, you know, so that was a big challenge and that's something to know, but the, all the improvements are all the equipment, you know, um, the improvements on the land, all the equipment to run, like a lot of that stuff is pretty much a hundred percent depreciable, yeah. um, in a lot of cases. Um, and so in livestock you could put on it. So, I mean, what are, I guess the question to you though, uh, just, and for my own knowledge, what, what are some just, if you could outline just bullet point tax benefits of, of owning and operating a, like a farm or, you know, a ranch or having land in general, like what are all the tax? Yeah. I mean, start, we, with we low property, start with low property taxes from those agriculture exemptions, um, depreciation. If you do have improvements on it, include, which includes things like trees and livestock, depending on what you're growing, timberland, if you're, if you're growing that, um, various tax credits, very specific, and, and they're hard to because they're they vary from state and, and municipality just like any other tax credits. But you know we've we've had seen farms and opportunity zones. So some of your listeners may have heard of those where 
you know, you're, you're, in fact, we've actually invested in one of our urban farms is an opportunity zone. With opportunity yeah. zones, you do have to like, to take those tax benefits, you do have to like improve it. Correct. Like 50%, right. Or something like yeah. that. Like you so, have to dramatically so, improve the land. Yeah. So in the case of the deal we did, it was basically kind of a, you know, rundown neighborhood. Cause that's basically what opportunity zones are supposed to be an old shell building. And now it's a vertical farm. Um, so they improved it and there's a restaurant and it's, it's doing really well. Um, so that's, yeah, opportunity zone and, you know, Farm to table, sport. right? Is that yeah, what? <laughs> okay. games. yeah, exactly. Um, you know, where it, it literally is like, there's a restaurant upstairs and in the basement is the, is the vertical farm. So they like, you can go down there and like look in the window while you're drinking your cocktail and then go upstairs and have a salad that was grown downstairs. So it's, you know, and I think they even have like a little elevator to get the stuff up. Hmm. So it's, it's definitely, you know, as locally grown as you can get, but uh, you know, other tax benefits, um, you know, I would say like anything else, although real estate has got super tax benefits and that's one of our, you know, people are incentivized to invest in it. Don't invest in a deal just because of the tax benefits invest in a deal. Cause it's a good deal. Right. But there are, you know, our culture has got its fair share of, of tax benefits. So what do you do in terms of management? I mean, if you're, if you've gone out, you found the farmer, you know, they just need money for one or two things. You give them the loan. Are you actively involved in it? Cause I imagine the farmer would want you as far away as possible. Cause yeah, you don't know anything. And how do you know the farmer's going to perform? Right. I mean, that's a lot of trust on, on yeah. their end. Right. It, it is. We're, we're fairly passive. I mean, we try to do all of our work up front and the due diligence. And then our investors actually help us with the due diligence because they get in front. Farmer gets in front of them and, and they ask really tough questions and, um, you know, kind of tear the deal apart before they decide to invest in it. So that's, um, you know, that's important. But for the most part, we're passive. Now, that said, we, we will engage our network to help our you know previous farm investments. You know, and at some point we're putting together this fund and we'll have a more active management role because we've kind of got the we feel like we've got the track record to do that now. But for the most part, our our investments are passive and our investors are our passive investors. If they want to go out and visit the farm. They're, they're welcome to do that. But uh, beyond that, it's a pretty passive situation. I guess, Chris, just the last question talking about your specific uh, for people that are interested in potentially investing with, with Harvest. Um, you know, what what is a fee structure look like for, for the manager on, on your end? And then. Mm -hmm. Like, it's still not clear to me on the timeline of, of this because I don't know, like, are, yeah. are these, because if these loans are term loans, is it a 10-year yep. term and then the investor gets paid back or what is that typical structure look sure. like? Sure. So so on the duration of our deals on, on the debt side, it's one to three years. We've exited a bunch of one-year loans and, you know, on our way and some three years as well and, and in between. On the equity side, it's more like, you know, buying a multifamily, fix it up and, and sell it so it might be three to five years to kind of stabilize the cash flows that sort of thing um you know and there's different ways you achieve an exit it's through a cash out refinance just like you might in a property um sale of the sale of the asset to another higher level sort of investor um or you know in in some cases we've done some agriculture technology kind of more startup -y types of companies where we're expecting a, a bigger sort of exit um, as far as the process uh, and our fees, uh, we take fees up front from the raise. So let's say a farmer wants a million dollars, we're going to raise 6% or so on top of that. You know, our fees structure is fairly complicated, but that's coming out of the raise. So it is, it's tagging the IRR. It's coming against the IRR, the expected return for those investors. We don't take asset management fees, but we do take a carried interest. So if the farmer, which is generally 20%, so and this is on the equity side. Um, if a farm does really well, they sell it, our investors get their money, then we take our money and we'll take 20% of those profits um, on top of our fees. And then on the debt side, we'll usually, besides the fees up front, like kind of an origination type of fee, we'll take a spread. So if it's a 15% loan, we'll take a couple of, couple of percent and then the investors will get the rest. So are there any areas of the United States that when you looked at it and saw that there were opportunities kind of stuck out in your mind as well. I never would have guessed that, um, you know, this area would be good for this investment. Yeah. I mean, Zach mentioned Wyoming. We haven't done Wyoming. We've looked at some deals there, but up in the great plains, man, we've, we've done really well. We've got uh, Montana, Idaho, 
Uh, a lot of our cattle producers are up there. We've looked at some other deals related to cattle processing up there. Um, I will tell you, there are some states that we don't like. We've done deals in some of these states, but we don't like just because the regulations are crazy. It's the same as real estate. Where I couldn't, I couldn't imagine which states those are. Chris. Yeah, I'm sure you can. But it's it's states, you know, states that have super high taxes and super, super burdensome regulations. And unfortunately, one of them is a really ag state, you know, California. We, we like it from an ag perspective. We hate it from a regulatory perspective. What is, is there an eviction process or something that if they default or how do you find somebody to, do you, do you foreclose? Yeah. What is that? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we haven't, we haven't had to do that, but the plan is, yeah, we will foreclose if there's land, we're going to take the land and we're going to, you know, liquidate as quickly as possible and get our investors whole. If there's, you know, assets on like cattle, we'll send them to auction and we'll sell them. I'm guessing that one to three year loan, like if you're talking, if you're lending debt, it sounds like, well, a one to three year loan would probably be along the lines of like expansion startup, mm -hmm. you know, um, where they're able to, you know, get other financing to buy you out. I mean, that wouldn't be truly like, you're not truly bridge or mezzanine financing in that scenario, but it's, it's short term debt, right. For them to. Yeah. Yeah. Get, that's exactly better right. debt, Qualify for better debt or. Yeah, in some cases they qualify for better debt. In other cases, we have had we just had a sponsor that we had done a note with him. He is a cattle guy. He paid us out, and we did a bigger note with him. Um, you know, he showed that he could get it. He had the cash flow to pay us off, and so he went out. Yeah, you know, we said, hey, what's the what's the biggest amount of money you can raise, um, or which is based on, you know, how big his land is and how many cattle he can, you know, you can't stick unlimited numbers of cattle on a piece of land. So in this case, we helped him expand his herd. We had another um, group where they owned the land, but they needed to put pivot in irrigation. So you've seen out the, these big, you know, half mile long pivot things that, that do big circles and they irrigate the land. So this farmer was able to take his unsuitable land for grazing and, irrigate it and so now it's more suitable for grazing which will enable him to grow his herd naturally and get higher you know and then get us out so unfortunately right now we're still in a rising rate environment i mean that's been that's been good but at some point we'll be we'll be able to in a declining rate environment maybe the next two years who knows um and then they'll be able to refinance out at lower rates but right now we're kind of we're seeing situations where you know if it's a new loan, it's one thing. If, if it's trying to refinance, that's very hard for us to do because we're not going to be able to compete with a rate they got three years ago, just like in a in a single family home or whatever. Yeah. Just just in summary here, before we go, like we talk about the farming side, let's talk about the ranching side with with yeah. livestock. What I mean, for someone, let's say that's like just looking for tax benefits and they're thinking about buying cattle and then leasing land or giving it to someone to raise the cattle for them, I mean, which is potentially viable option. Yeah. Um, like what, what, how does that, how are you underwriting cattle? What does that structure look like um, from a business perspective and what are the tax benefits of cattle ownership and, and raising? Yeah. Cattle? I mean, so there's the model you kind of described there. There are some small ranchers out there that will do what's called an absentee ownership program. You don't see that as much lately, but there are some where, like you said, you give them money, they go out and buy some cattle, they raise the cattle, they feed the cattle, they sell the cattle. You don't, you don't have to touch cattle. You don't have to you name your cows or anything like that. You just let them do it all. And, That's you know, it. You're not going out and branding them, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the tax benefits of that are, you know, it depends on what the farmer's got, what the rancher's got going on. But there might be, uh, you know, there, there could be depreciation. There could be, it's just, it's really hard to say. You know, I wouldn't say there's direct tax advantages to doing that. It's just, you're benefiting. Um, some of these, you know, some of these ranchers have pretty high margins, like 20, 30%, depending on what, where they are in the cow's lifespan and who they're selling to and how big they are. The bigger they are, the better prices they can command by the big meat packers. So one of the things we worked with a, a company that aggregated a lot of different smaller ranchers guaranteed the pricing and sold it up to the big meat packers. And, you know, you've heard of some of these guys like JBS and Cargill and things like that. Um, we tend to, we like to work with smaller ranchers who are trying to get bigger. Do you have a kind of minimum size that you require of the, the ranchers or farmers 
Are you yeah, the smallest loan we're going to do is about two hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I meant uh, I meant land size wise. Oh, yeah, yeah, it depends. You know, it depends on what they're doing. There's a lot of a lot of ranchers these days. The ones we like to work where they're doing these very intensive grazing techniques where they pretty small paddocks and they graze. Um, you know, a lot of cattle on them more than you would normally. And then you move the cattle on, you let that ground rest and then you move them on again, you let that ground rest. Um, and it's really good for, it's really good for the soil and seems to be okay for the cows, but you're basically mimicking like kind of a bison sort of grazing or. Yeah. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. The website is harvestreturns.com. That's harvestreturns.com. Chris, is there anything we haven't asked you that you feel is important for our audience to know since this is our first agriculture interview? I'm sure we missed something you think is important. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of real estate investors out there. It's great. I love real estate. Um, I'd ask him to kind of consider agriculture, but educate yourself. You know, there's a lot of resources out there. Start side. We've got podcasts and blogs and things like that. We want to help people understand before they invest in this asset class that might be new. It's just like anything you guys are out here to educate. That's great. Um, so people get smart before you start putting your money to work. Fantastic. Well, again, the website is harvestreturns.com. If you're interested in the single family uh, space as well, you can head on over to rentretirement.com to see what inventory we have there. And if you want to see Zach's report on the top 20 markets to invest in in 2023, just send an email to podcasts at rentretirement.com. That's podcast at rentretirement.com. Really appreciate the time you spent educating yourself today. And we'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos, like this one, or this one here.